Welcome to the Holistic Psychiatry Podcast. I'm Courtney Brown Snyder, a physician and holistic adult and child psychiatrist. In this episode, I'll be discussing a breakthrough theory of bipolar disorder that Dr. William Walsh recently presented at the Society of Neuroscience. So this past week, I've had the pleasure of attending the advanced course for Walsh-trained practitioners. If you're not familiar, the Walsh Research Institute was founded by Dr. William Walsh and has looked at the nutrient levels of over 30,000 people with brain-related symptoms. And from that research found a surprisingly small number of nutrient imbalances. So these are the imbalances that we address using nutrient protocols, usually with significant and sometimes dramatic benefits. Such brain conditions include depression, anxiety, panic, OCD, ADHD, autism, dementia, schizophrenia, and bipolar disorder. However, bipolar disorder has been difficult to treat. More than 9 million Americans have been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. This severe condition can lead to drug or alcohol use, financial or legal problems, discord in relationships, work and school instability, and or suicide attempts or suicide. The course typically begins with an acute onset, followed by episodes of mania and depression, which often worsen in severity over time. In this post, after describing bipolar disorder, I will use Dr. William Walsh's comprehensive theory of bipolar disorder, which he recently shared at the Society of Neuroscience, to explain the cause of bipolar disorder, the reason for the onset, persistence, and for some increasing severity over time, the reason for increased likelihood of other health conditions, the reason for the switch between manic and depressive states, and how this information can impact treatment. Bipolar disorder. It's important to note that the type of bipolar disorder I'm referring to here is bipolar 1 disorder a condition in which there are discrete episodes of mania, often followed by episodes of depression. Such episodes can occur rarely or even multiple times a year. Manic episodes usually last a week up to several months and include three or more of the following. Increase in activity, energy, or agitation, distorted sense of well-being or self-confidence, needing much less sleep than usual, usually talkative or talking fast, racing thoughts or flight of ideas, so jumping from one topic to another, easily distracted, poor decision-making, such as excessive spending or risky sexual behavior, and may become psychotic, which this would be when someone has a break from reality. Hypomania, on the other hand, is a less severe form of mania and has less of an impact on functioning at work, school, social activities, and relationships. However, manic episodes have to be present for someone to have bipolar 1. Depressive episodes, which often last a couple of weeks but can vary, include five or more of the following symptoms that again will affect functioning at work, school, relationships, and social activities. These include depressed moods, Sadness, lacking feelings, hopelessness, irritability, anger, tearfulness, a marked loss of interest or enjoyment in activities, weight loss or weight gain without dieting or overeating, too much or too little sleep, behavior slowed down or there can be restlessness, fatigue or loss of energy, feelings of worthlessness or inappropriate guilt, problems concentrating or making decisions, suicidal thoughts, plans, or attempts. So again, with bipolar 1, there are manic episodes and depressive episodes. In bipolar 2, however, and this is a different condition, this diagnosis is given when someone has at least one major depressive episode and at least one hypomanic episode. So depressive episodes are often longer in this case, and there are never manic episodes. Despite its name, this is not a milder form of bipolar 1. Biochemically, it is considered a different disorder. 
Rapid cycling is a term used to describe bipolar disorder when, in the past year, there have been at least four episodes of switching from mania or hypomania to depression. This can describe either type 1 or type 2, depending on the presence or absence of mania. As with all psychiatry, the terms come from the symptoms and not necessarily a biochemical understanding. Dr. Walsh's comprehensive plan, which I'll describe, focuses on bipolar 1, in which there are manic episodes usually followed by depressive episodes. And again, this is a more severe condition. And separately, I would say, for those who struggle with mood swings changing within a day or within a week, as opposed to discrete mood episodes of mania or depression, I would consider pyrrole disorder and or mast cell activation. Genetics or epigenetics, having a first degree relative, a parent or sibling with bipolar disorder is a risk factor. After 30 years of genetic research, however, a gene has not been identified. The genetics are more complicated than that. It appears that there are many genes involved. The 2021 Genome-Wide Association Study This study compared the genomes of about 5,000 individuals with bipolar disorder and about 8,000 controls, so those without bipolar disorder. Over time, more and more bipolar genetic variants have been identified. By 2021, there were 64. However, there are expected to be hundreds. Of the 64 genetic variants, 49 are considered DNA repair genes and antioxidant genes. These occur throughout the body and not just the brain. Just as it sounds, DNA repair genes make enzymes that repair DNA. Antioxidant genes make enzymes that support our protective antioxidant system. Many of these genetic variants are also associated with cancer and other conditions impacted by DNA damage. This would suggest that those with bipolar disorder come into the world with a vulnerability to problems with repairing DNA. And remember that DNA damage can translate to cell damage, tissue damage, and in the case of the brain, neuronal damage. But this vulnerability alone does not create illness. Something occurs that shifts this vulnerability into illness. Accelerated DNA damage. What is damaging the DNA? Free radicals and thus oxidative stress. To remind you, oxidative stress occurs when our body's inherent antioxidant systems are overwhelmed or used up by free radicals. And this excess in free radicals could be due to an insult such as a toxic exposure, some on-board source of inflammation, trauma, chronic stress. And this depletion of our protection or antioxidants leaves our cells and DNA vulnerable. If we have variants on the protective genes, then we can be even more vulnerable. Numerous studies have found high levels of superoxide, hydroxyl, and ONNO free radicals in those with bipolar disorder. This vulnerability to DNA damage due to decrease in repair also explains why many with bipolar disorder have an increased risk of other health conditions including heart disease, breast cancer, multiple sclerosis, kidney failure, immune disorders, migraines, gastrointestinal illnesses, and others. Genetic weakness on ion channels. The remaining identified genes, again there were 64, but only 49 have been associated with DNA repair genes and antioxidant genes. So the remaining are more specific to bipolar disorder and relate to ion channel genes. Ion channels exist on the neuronal membranes So if you remember, nerve cells are very long, and so this membrane is the outside of the nerve cell, and these ion channels allow potassium, sodium, and calcium to move in and out of the nerve cell, and this creates an electrical charge that travels down the cell, 
and once reaching the end, results in a neurotransmitter being released into the space between that neuron and other neurons, allowing communication. Onset of illness. Here again, an epigenetic event, a toxic exposure, trauma, significant illness, impacts the production of the proteins used in these ion channels, which affects the movement of ions in and out of the cell. More specifically, what's happening is a flooding of potassium ions outside the cell, leading to a hyperactivity of that particular nerve cell. This is why Dr. Walsh's theory considers bipolar disorder a channelopathy. So, pathy means illness. So, this is an illness of the channel. Euthymia. Euthymia is when the mood is neither manic nor depressed. And this interestingly appears to be the first mood state after the onset of the condition. The flooding of potassium outside the cell leads to hyperactivity of neurons for serotonin. However, that doesn't appear to cause symptoms since serotonin inhibits or keeps the activity of dopamine and norepinephrine in check. Mania. The onset of mania starts to occur when the serotonin hyperactivity from that potassium flooding outside the cell starts to fizzle out. What follows is a reduction in the inhibition of the neurotransmitters, dopamine, norepinephrine, these are all activating, that cause widespread neuronal hyperactivity and thus manic symptoms. Eventually, the declining serotonin activity becomes the dominating force and triggers depression, which may persist for some time. Over time, however, the serotonin nerves return to that hyperactive state again, which keeps things at bay, resulting in a stable or euthymic mood. Progression of illness. The importance of preventing manic episodes in order to avoid escalation of this condition has been well known. Dr. Walsh's theory also addresses this. Aside from impacting neurotransmission, the problems occurring at those ion channels are also associated with further DNA damage. This means that each episode can potentially add to the DNA damage. Add to this DNA damage that increases for all of us as we age. Left untreated, the original and often persistent insult, so again, that could be some form of toxicity, such as mold toxicity that has never been addressed. The events reoccurring at the ion channel which cause DNA damage, and then add to that aging, and you can see where there would be a progression and increasing severity of this illness for many people. Treatment. As with any theory, the inevitable question becomes, how does this impact treatment? Allopathic or conventional, mainstream, however you'd like to refer to it, psychiatry uses medication approaches that aim and usually succeed at stabilizing mood. Again, this is important because of the severity of illness, but also because of the potential physiologic damage caused by the ongoing episodes. What isn't typically addressed in conventional psychiatry, however, are the sources of the oxidative stress. Does this person have mold toxicity, Lyme, Bartonella, metal toxicity, Candida, or other microbial overgrowth? Do they have chemical exposure, high EMF exposure, trauma, and or chronic stress, or a chronic inflammatory condition that is continuing to deplete the protections and contribute to DNA damage? Another factor often not considered in conventional psychiatry is support for the antioxidant system. As with any brain condition, robust antioxidant support is indicated to address free radicals, but in this case also to address damage, ongoing damage to ion channels. Also not addressed are nutrient imbalances that are typically also at play, such as methylation imbalances, often overmethylation, as well as pyrrole disorder and copper-zinc imbalances. Each of these can be exacerbated by high oxidative stress and can further add to the oxidative stress. 
Research into targeted antioxidants will be needed to build upon Dr. Walsh's research. The free radicals that I mentioned are more easily addressed in the body than in the brain. In the meantime, in addition to more typical antioxidants, NAC and metallothionine promotion therapy, which is a combination of glutathione, zinc, B6, and specific amino acids, which support the functioning of metallothionine proteins at the blood-brain barrier, are expected to be beneficial, again, in combination with the previous considerations I've mentioned, addressing oxidative stress, using antioxidants, but also the source of oxidative stress and addressing the nutrient imbalances. Prevention. Because bipolar disorder appears to be an epigenetic DNA damage illness, caused again by major oxidative overload, early antioxidant treatment in those who are vulnerable may prevent the onset and development of the disease. At some point in the not-so-far-off future, we'll be able to identify as early as infancy who has these genetic vulnerabilities. I hope you found this useful. If you would like more information on the work of Dr. William Walsh and the Walsh Research Institute, where they also have a list of practitioners, those of us who are trained in these approaches, you can visit the Walsh Research Institute website at www.walshinstitute.org. As always, I welcome any comments or questions wherever you're listening or reading this. And if you'd like to help me get this information out into the world, please consider sharing. To receive these newsletters or episodes in your mailbox each week, please consider subscribing at Courtney Snyder, MD, where I also have information on my monthly mentorship group, my non-patient phone consultations, and my treatment practice. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode. Until then, take care.